going to do a talk just to give you a rough idea what we've been talking, what we've been working on for the last one year, maybe 18 months. Um, you know, if, if you're following GStreamer development on a daily basis, um, then there's probably not much news um, for you in here, but um, most people aren't, so, you know, we just like to repeat what we've been working on. Um, just a quick introduction, who are we? Um, I'm Tim Müller, I'm one of GStreamer core developers and um, release managers, and Sebastian. Well, basically the same. I did the last few GSMR releases and well, probably also touched every piece of code until now. So. Right, and we've, uh, we work for Centricula um, and do GStreamer consulting. Um, right, so just a quick introduction in case um, you don't know. What is GStreamer? Um, it's basically a bunch of libraries um, to do multimedia processing. It's pipeline based, um, it's a bit like Lego, you can just take you know, different types of uh, elements and you can hook them together and then you know, your media flows through it. Um, it's got lots of different components, pads, elements as we call them. Um, we provide plugins uh, which you can wrap other libraries around it, you can provide all kinds of different functionalities and these plugins are basically your kind of Lego pieces that you can combine. Um, together and we provide a unified API around all that um, that you can use to to do all that. Um, right, and we, we we wrap everything. We don't invent everything from scratch, but there are lots of you know lots of good development stuff uh, work that's being done. Uh, you know, codecs that are being written, uh, libav, mpeg, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these libraries we don't reinvent them. We just use them um, and make them available via our abstract API. Um, we've got very high level API if you just want a play bin or um, you know, a camera, uh, Photoshop, uh, sort of for a photo booth type of application, we have a high level API for that. Um, if you have very low level stuff, you want to do very dynamic pipelines, you can do that as well. Um, there's some high level API missing, we're going to get there one day, but you know. Um, we integrate with other frameworks. Um, both in terms of uh, being used by other frameworks and using other frameworks. So, you know, we can, uh, we, we can be used in WebKit, Firefox, Clutter, uh, you know, all that we integrate with it. Um, you can use us on Windows, um, you know. So our goal is basically to, to be adaptable and work everywhere. All right, what are we going to talk about? Um, just what happened in the last year or so with GStreamer. Um, in case you haven't heard, we've released GStreamer 1.0 a while back, um, and GStreamer 1.2 is the next stable release version um, that's come out last October. Lots of new features. Um, the uh, binary well, platform support for Windows, etc., and OS X and iOS and Android. And after that, in the future, we have GStreamer 1.4 and GStreamer 1.6 which are our new stable feature releases. So we kind of adopted a, a GLE versioning scheme, which I'll mention in the next slide. Um, right. So um, just in case you haven't noticed, I'm just mentioning it because people are confused by it, apparently. Um, so 010 is the old and ancient version, not developed anymore, not maintained. Um, don't use it for new stuff. Um, we realize some people have to continue with it, but um, you know, it's dead. Forget about it. 1.0 is the new stable API. Um, if we ever break API again, hopefully not for a long time, it will be 2.0. So everything that starts with one point something is backwards compatible. It's very much like GNOME or GLib, um, basically. Um, we have taken, well, we've started doing regular, we've started separating feature releases from bug fix releases. Um, so we have you know, the GLib versioning scheme now, and we do 1.0, and then 1.01, 1.02 for bug fix releases, and then you know, the, the big feature versions are called 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, etc. Um, all right, so we've got a, quite a few uh, bug fix releases we've done. The current uh, stable release is 1.2, 1.4. Um, hopefully it's gonna come out around March, April. Um, it took us a very, very long time to get from 1.0 to 1.2, about a year, and I think that's much longer than we wanted to take. Originally, we had planned to do a new feature release every three months or so. That didn't really work out. So um, hopefully we can, I think our goal currently is to stabilize on a six month re release cycle, so we can roughly do releases around March, April, and September. 
October or so. Um, but in general, I think all the major applications I'm aware of um, have been ported to 1.0. Um, there is a GStreamer support in Firefox now, which has been worked on. Um, and Enlightenment has been ported to 1.0 as well. Uh, just a quick review. Um, what does 1.0 actually mean? What have we changed? Um, you know, in general, it's just an API cleanup. Um, stuff we wanted to get rid of, stuff we wanted to fix. Um, in general, from application point of view, the changes are more of an evolution than a revolution. You know, if you have an application, most stuff is going to be the same. You, you will have some minor changes you have to make, but um, most of the changes affect plugins and low-level stuff. Uh, conceptually, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, so from a risk perspective, um, you know, I mean, bugs are always there, but from risk perspective, it's well understood how it works, um, how the, you know, how the threading works, how the interaction works, and we haven't changed that, basically. Um, but we did fix some of the big problems um, that we had in 0.10, um, memory handling, etc. And hopefully, well, the 1.0 API will be stable for quite some time. Um, bindings are now provided via geoptic inspection. We couldn't do that in the past because of our uh, custom mini object stuff, which were, well, special. So GI couldn't handle that. But now we've changed that and it can be handled. And it's all good. All right. Binary releases. We now have binary releases for uh, Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. So you can hack on all these platforms with GStreamer and write stuff using open source multimedia frameworks. And it includes all plugins, well not all plugins, almost all plugins. If any plugins are missing, um, give us a shout and maybe we can just add them. It's usually an oversight and not intentional. Unless they haven't been ported, then it's intentional. But it's usually not so hard to port them. All right. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Development 1.4. Hopefully, it comes out in May, uh, March, April. Um, we've been working on it since, since September. Um, as I said, it's going to be released very soon. Uh, lots of new features, and Sebastian is going to take, tell you a bit more about all that. So one of the very big changes uh, we did for 1.0 and the following releases is um, for hardware integration. If you want to use all kinds of special hardware, especially on embedded devices, stuff like hardware codecs, um, it wasn't, well, it was possible to do that in 0.10, but it was quite awful and hackish. You really didn't want to do that. So what we now have is um, interfaces to share all kinds of, um, well, hardware context between devices. So for example, you can share um, a display handle between all the elements automatically. We now have stuff to handle all kinds of different um, memory representations. So for example, in 010, it was only possible to um, have something like system memory, something that you can allocate with malloc. Everything else was just a hack. And what we now can do is uh, we can wrap stuff like DMA buff or EGL images or stuff like a VA a surface of VA API. Then what was uh, added quite recently is um, we have proper negotiation between the elements of to um, make it possible that um, the hardware features are well, the best possible solution of uh, the best possible combination of elements is selected that are available on your computer. So for example, well, on most of the latest Intel lap uh, Air laptops with an Intel chipset, you will automatically use the VA API elements for decoding if it's possible, even without the application having to know about that. And then well, over the last months, we also made lots of uh, further improvements there. There were lots of bugs still. And I think nowadays it can just work out of the box. So what does this mean? Basically, you're using stuff like well, WebKit or just your um, uh, video player on your desktop. It will just use the hardware codecs that are available without the applications knowing about that, if they are written properly. Um, also, on embedded systems, like well, on Android or on the Raspberry Pi, stuff just works. 
And uh, because of all these new interfaces we added, there are much less workarounds and you actually have clean code and you don't have to cry if you read the code later. It's really, it was awful before. So especially on the Raspberry Pi, what we uh, now have uh, is a proper integration uh, of OpenMax IL. What is now possible, for example, is that you have on this $25 mini computer, you can have HD video decoding, going zero copy to the display. It's just happening extremely fast without using any CPU. And uh, people are using this now nowadays for, well, just video playback, but also complex stuff like having a multi-screen display wall or producing some kind of streaming server. So for example, um, the Raspberry Pi also has some kind of camera you can use and well, it can automatically use the hardware encoders on the device to produce HD video as uh, H.264 and then you can send it over the network and all this works in GStreamer now without uh, well anything special to know uh, for the application. Then other stuff has happened, uh, GSTV, GSTV API was improved a lot by the Intel guys. Again, as I mentioned before, it's just working now. That wasn't the case before. It was the promise for the last few years that it's just working, and now we're finally there. Then recently, uh, what was started uh, is a decoder element uh, that is using the Video for Linux 2 decoder API. So many of the um, hardware codec manufacturers, uh, people like uh, companies like well Samsung or um, ST are now providing um, video for Linux drivers for the hardware codecs, and well we now have a proper plugin for that. And again, it's just working. For other companies, well, the hardware industry is a bit slow sometimes, but stuff is coming out, uh, stuff is going to, uh, is, um, well, we see uh, that they are working on stuff and um, I think uh, in the near future we will have, have proper hardware integration for all the different uh, chipsets out there in GStreamer. Then some other things uh, that have uh, happened is, uh, well, there are the OpenGL plugins we have. OpenGL is a bit special. You can't re uh, really use all kinds of different threads in OpenGL you usually have to do everything from a single thread. Well, in GStreamer, we have the problem, we are completely multi-threaded, everything is happening in a different thread, and uh, th this was uh, quite difficult to implement, but uh, nowadays it's possible to have all kinds of um, GL-based elements in your pipeline that can interact without problems with uh, software-based elements, that can interact without problems with other hardware-related elements. So you can just, for example, have your um, uh, a filter somewhere in your pipeline that does um, some kinds of effects or uh, deinterlacing or whatever with uh, GL shaders. And um, well, it currently runs on all kinds of platforms. It works on OS X, it works on Android, it works on Linux, of course. Um, and it works now on the Raspberry Pi. Then we um, integrated lots of smaller things. So for example, um, the blues elements were uh, integrated. So we now have um, well, support for um, directly using, uh, say, a Bluetooth headset from GStreamer. Then um, lots of work has been done on the HTTP adaptive streaming protocols, stuff like HLS, Dash, Microsoft Smooth Streaming. So that's basically what everybody nowadays is uh, using for stuff like video on demand. And also some work there has been done on, well, unfortunately, DRM stuff, because content providers want that. And even that stuff is now working in GStreamer. Then um, lots of work has been done on MPTS support, on DVB support. So for example, um, well, if you have uh, some kind of uh, DVB device and want to plug it into your laptop, it's probably going to work now, if th it's supported by the Linux DVB API. Then um, we integrated H.265 uh, or HEVC support. We have now parsers for that. It's integrated in all kinds of elements. For decoding, we are currently using uh, the really great decoder that is inside uh, libav. Then we have support well, for the next generation codec from uh, Google, the VP9 codec. 
which is also, I think they recently started to use it on YouTube. Then we also have initial Hadala support, which is uh, well the next next generation codec that is currently de uh, being developed by Xiv and Mozilla. It's not stable yet, well, but you can experiment a bit with it. It won't be uh, doing much useful stuff, but if you want to um, help on development there with GSUMA, you have very easy ways to test all kinds of video inputs there, test uh, how the decoder is um, working. And I think it's a good toolbox um, if you want to work on the codec, because you can have all kinds of inputs uh, directly handled by GStreamer and then put it into the new encoder. Then many changes were done on the RTP, RTSP stuff, both client side and server side. So what we now have is uh, in the server, for example, um, authentication. We have support for encryption via SRTP. We have support for stuff like retransmissions. So for example, um, RTP usually is uh, using UDP, packets can get lost, especially on wireless networks. And um, there's no um, support for well, requesting packets that were lost. Uh, lost. This can happen completely automatically. Then we improved uh, the net clock support in GCMA. So what does that mean? We have a generic um, object in GCMA that allows you to share a clock of a single device over the network with all other devices. So what you can have, for example, is all kinds of displays showing exactly the same video and audio completely synchronized between devices. This worked quite good before already, as except for, well, on wireless networks where sometimes it can happen that you have lots uh, very long delays because, well, for example, you're currently um, walking with your mobile device from your living room to your kitchen and then maybe you lose uh, the Wi-Fi connection for some time and then it can happen that sometimes a packet is going to take multiple seconds until it uh, arrives on your computer and this um, made the estimation of um, well the usage um, or the synchronization to um, the master clock inside the network quite unreliable but um, some improvements were done there to well ignore these complete outliers uh, that are comp taking much much longer than uh, the average packets and uh, I think it's working very reliable now. Then we also have, of course, Wayland support, the great new thing that is that people are already starting to use now. Especially in the GL plugins, um, the Wayland support is really great nowadays. Uh, it's even supporting the new subsurface stuff so you can uh, well integrate your um, your video via the um, video sync into Wayland applications. Um, then the Genonlin and G GC editing services uh, libraries were also ported to 1.0. Lots of improvements were made and finally we will now have a new PTV release. PTV is a video editor based on GStreamer and well they didn't have a release since I don't know three years, four years or something and I think now when they are making the new stable re uh, release you will have a good free video editor based on GStreamer that can actually be used and that does not crash all the time like before. Really in the past it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't really usable, but now it is. And then of course we fixed lots of lots of bugs. We have Bugzilla under control again. In the past, in the GNOME Bugzilla we were in the top 10 products with the most bugs. Now we are out of there. I don't know at which position we are now because, well, it's not listed there. Um, and I think in the uh, last year or last one and a half year, we fixed about 1,000, 1,600 bugs in Bugzilla. So lots of stuff has happened there. Of course, some of them were also feature requests. Right, sorry for the audio noise. Um, quick look into the future. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, 1.4 coming up in March, April. Um, after that, 1.6, hopefully um, around September. Um, of course, lots of new features. Um, one thing we, we really have on our roadmap is um, documentation and tutorials. I think we need 
sort of more focused, better documentation. Um, gstreamer.com, which has nothing to do with the gstreamer project, um, has quite good tutorials. So people kind of land on that, and then they're confused. So because they're for zero ten as well. But so we really need to work on that. So it's something we have planned. Um, in general, there's lots of stuff around web, um, webby stuff, HTML5, etc. Uh, WebKit, etc. There, there's lots of media source, audio source integration. They need kind of special API to signal stuff, which we don't have in GStreamer yet. So there's kind of lots of stuff in Bugzilla that's pending. Um, but we need to expose additional information to make all that work and usable in WebKit. Um, you have picture and picture, different audio types and subtitle type streams, and um, new buffering modes in Playbin. Um, well, Web VV VTT, that's um, well, subtitle stuff as well. Uh, WebRTC, of course, you probably have heard of. Um, that's work being done there. 3D video is one of the biggest things we haven't really done yet. Um, well, it's been done in 010 as a um, sum of code project, um, but it was sort of very separate from the normal stuff. You couldn't integrate it because of the caps explosion stuff we, we had. So, but anyway, in, in 1.0 we can do that. We have some very, very minimal um, API for that, but there's more API that needs fleshing out. So, you know, we kind of need to put our heads together and look at all the requirements and figure out a way to signal all that properly. Um, it's, it's a bit messy, so you just need to, someone needs to do it, but it, it's on the roadmap. I've been saying that for years, haven't I? Uh, more hardware support, um, but this time for real. Um, more hardware support, well, there's always more to do, but I mean, we're, we're kind of making improvements, especially via the open um, Mac stuff and then the vendor provided. Well, since, since vendors kind of are uh, narrowing down on the video for, video for Linux API for providing decoder support, I hope that will get us there uh, soon. Blu-ray, also something I've been mentioning. I mean, the truth is the, the video uh, LAN people have, have actually been doing all the hard work, so there's a library and everything. We just have to hook it in. Um, shouldn't even take much time. I did one of these days. Um, all right. That brings us to the end already. Do you have any questions, comments, anything at all? Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't. So you mentioned how hardware, hardware divides differently. Hardware? Divides differently. Oh, discovery. Yes, sorry. How do you plan to make that work when your hardware divides is actually like a little device made of multiple hardware companies that use hardware and those hardware companies? We don't have a plan for that. We have to figure that out. Okay. Um, the idea for the device discovery and, and um, well, I haven't actually mentioned the device discovery, have I? But, yeah. Um, Sorry, I skipped over that. Well, it's kind of blocking on me currently. But <coughs> the idea behind that is it's supposed to be a very simple API um, targeted at what we know applications now want. Basically, you have an application that says, you know, give me the camera devices or capture devices or give me a list of DVD drives um, or a sound output or something. I mean, it's supposed to be very, very high level, very basic. It's not supposed to be, you know, you can discover everything that's there. We're not going to, it's going to be simple. And we're probably, I mean, it's well possible that we're going to say, we're just not going to deal with that at all. So, I, but I mean, I, I don't have an answer yet, really. So. Any other questions? Sorry. I don't know. Have you been looking for a transcoding application in GStreamer? There's Transmageddon, for example. Um, have you tried that? Yeah. All right. Well, it's, 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 I think it's very simple. It's supposed to work quite well. So I don't know if, it's, if, ha if it has a million uh, options to do stuff. There's a SourceForge project called Chentrans, um, which is more like a command line thing with different uh, specialized support for transcoding. Um, but yes, I don't. Know. We we there's still sort of <clears throat> well, there's still things we could do better. I think applications exist. Um, we don't have dedicated transcoding API yet. Um, something like a transcode bin, something on the list. But 
the one that's been working on that, yeah. So there was another question here somewhere. <coughs> well, um, yes, we have unit tests, of course, um, in the in all the source modules. So you can run your know, make check in the source tree, and it, it kind of tests all kind of stuff. You can run make uh, check dash valgrind, and it runs all the unit tests for valgrind. Um, that's what we have. There's um, there are sort of test suites which you can run over media files. Um, there's work going on um, to, to integrate all that into Jenkins, BuildBots, etc. Um, so it's, you know, it's not perfect yet. There's quite, I mean, I can imagine lots of stuff. I mean, fuzzing, I mean, we don't actually do it, um, but the truth is, I mean, there are other people who do it and then they start filing bugs and um, but <coughs> also, well, I mean, there are commercial vendors which, which use our stuff in their products, and they usually kind of do that internally and then just submit patches. I mean, in the, in the Nokia days, there was lots of stuff where they just had gigabytes full of fast files, and then someone just spent months working through that and fixing all that up. So um, hopefully we haven't regressed. But I mean, it's not something we actively do, but you know, I think in general we it works well. I mean, you can run GSD Discover on a directory full of fast files to make sure it doesn't crash, but just errors out or works. So, um, but as on, of course, also there are lots of um, companies who use GStream internally for their systems, and they have actually quite good test suites, which are not public. But you can tell because basically you do a change, and then they come back later and they say, well, you know, your change has caused the following problem. If you run this, um, you know, five days nonstop, then suddenly you will get that and that overflow. And you say, yeah, okay, <laughs> good, great, thanks. So, or sometimes they find these, I don't know, they have stuff that just runs the same test over and over and over and over and over again, like nothing else. And then they say, well, you know, this fails about one every two million times. Um, there's a race condition somewhere. So, I mean, they, they exist, but they're not... And there's, there's some effort also going on to push some of that stuff uh, public. Um, there's some new API that people have developed. Um, so I, hope, I mean, there's, there's work being done in that area. Sorry, we are at the end of it all. So thank you, thank you very much for coming. Uh, see you around.